Yo guys, welcome. Let's do another faction guide. This time we take a closer look on the Tomb Kings. The Tomb Kings are the latest faction of the actual game, but they already have their regiments of renown. So this is very good for doing a faction guide, an army guide, so I don't have to st uh, yeah, start all over when the regiment of renown appear. Of course I will do it like in my other faction guides. I will start to talk about the strengths and the weaknesses and then we are going to continue with a closer look on each unit, on the lords, on the infantry, on the monsters and all that stuff. And then in the end I'm going to talk a little bit about competitive builds and one or two suggestions you are going to find there and yeah, we will see how this works out and yeah, and please enjoy my faction guide over here let me know what you think in the comments if you haven't seen already my other faction guides for example Darwi or vampire accounts make sure that you also check these faction guides out and yeah nothing more to say about that let's start with the strengths and weaknesses and let's go So let's talk about the pro and cons and let's start with the strength I would say. The biggest strength of the Tomb Kings are definitely their big monsters or constructs. So sharp the Cameron Wars Sphinx, Necro Sphinx are just a few out of the roster. So we can see we have a huge selection of different monster models available. And this is the most important point for the Tomb Kings. Without their monsters, they are quite useless, you can say. The most, the biggest advantage by far are their monsters. So you are going to find in 99% of all matches, monsters in the builds, mixed with infantry, mixed with cavalry in the army composition, of course. But monsters are very important, the most important point, because it makes the whole army more steady. And this is the reason why, in the most cases, all players are going to take one or two monsters or more to the battlefield. Another advantage in this case is that the two king units crumble instead of routing. And then, then they're not going to route off, they're starting to crumble after a time like the Vampire Counts. And as I explained in my Vampire Counts faction guide, this can either be an advantage or a disadvantage. But in the case of the Tomb Kings, I would definitely say it is, it is an advantage because the most infantry units are very low tier or quite low tier. So they are go would route off very fast. So crumbling is a, a, a huge advantage in this case. So your front line is more steady and uh, spots are not going to break up very easy, not very fast. And this fact includes of course the next advantage that the Tomb King units are also naturally immune to psychology. They are not going to get terrified or routing off and all that stuff. So this is, this is also quite an advantage over here. Also an advantage is of course that all units causing fear like the vampire counts is also in the most cases advantage on the battlefield. And of course the monsters causing in addition to that terror. Another quite unique characteristic, quite a unique advantage are their monsters. They are not only monsters, they are uh, constructs and these constructs are really curable. So we have, uh, for example, the Necrotect and with this Necrotect you can cure, you can heal up your monsters. And this is quite a unique characteristic or this is quite an advantage. You can say it's quite similar to the dinosaurs from the Lizardmen, also heal curable very easy. But uh, the, I would say this is an advantage and worth to be mentioned. Another unique feature of the Tomb Kings is the Realm of Souls. And the Realm of Souls provide regeneration for your troops if you reach tier 1, tier 2 and tier 3. And how many deaths of your own troops are necessary for that you can find this information as I said in the upper bar over there. If you are going to reach tier 1, tier 2 and tier 3 your units will get a 
uh, regeneration for a short period of time. And in addition to that, in tier 3, you can spawn a group of Ushapti, what is quite good. Overall, I don't see any tactic to in uh, interact with this ability or with, with this feature. So in the most cases, you are going to reach the tier 3 and you are able to spawn your group of Ushapti. But also here, of course, where's light, there's shadow. So let's talk about the cons. The biggest disadvantage overall is the weak infantry. And we don't have a relatively weak infantry. We have a weak infantry. And if we take a look on the roster, we can also see that the infantry is quite pricey. So we have a relatively high price regarding a low performance and this is this is a problem because in total in average the performance is not really good and the price is quite high so they are overall not really cost efficient you can say and the problem is the infantry alone on the battlefield is not able to win a game you need they need always support from monsters and other stuff and this is overall in my opinion the biggest problem and biggest disadvantage for the tomb kings so if we take a look, for example, on the low tier units, we can find the skeleton warriors or the skeleton spearmen. And I mean, give me a break. They are quite co they are quite pricey. So we have a price of 350, 325, what is quite high. So you are not able to mess them and the performance is far away from superior. So we, if we compare the stats of the skeleton spearmen to the stats of, this, uh, of the empire spearmen, we can see that the empire spearmen are by far better on each point. And um, of course, the skeleton spearmen crumble, but overall, this is not really cost efficient. And you can leave out the skeleton warriors completely, these guys are complete garbage. The skeleton spearmen are at, uh, at least quite steady. The other problem is, of course, the lack of AP damage uh, on the infantry roster. We have just one unit with. Uh, a quite good amount of AP damage and this is also here the problem you have to bring monsters in addition if you have if you need a lot of AP damage the next disadvantage is not really a big thing and not really a big disadvantage but it's worth to be mentioned the Tomb Kings only have access to three magical laws, the law of death, the law of light and the Nehekarian magical law. And that is not really much. Of course, the most competitive law in the complete game, the law of death is included, but therefore the law of light is not really the, the first pick. And um, of course, the Nehekarian warrior is quite okay, quite a good magical law. But overall, as I said, just three laws, that is not really much and can be a disadvantage in some cases. The next disadvantage is also not really a big thing, but worth to be mentioned. The amount of different Tomb King units is quite small. So for example, if we take a look on the infantry roster and subtract the regiments of renown, we can find just five different infantry units available, and that is not really much. The selection of lords and heroes is okay, but the missile infantry and the cavalry has a very small selection of different units. And here's the problem, your, your opponent probably guess what you're going to bring to the battlefield cause the variation of different builds and army compositions is very limited and this is, this is a disadvantage. So let's start with the Lords and let's directly start with the cheapest Lord on the roster, the Tomb King. And the Tomb King is armored and shielded, the amount of melee defense and melee attack is quite good. We have 50 and 60, weapon strength is also okay. The amount of armor piercing is quite low, therefore we have just 160. He has a silver shield and the amount of armor is quite heavily armored or the amount of armor is okay. So if you want a cheap Lord, you can pick the tomb king it's also able to sit him on a camera and walls things a skeleton chariot and a skeleton steed so if you don't need too much ap damage you can bring him but also on the camera and walls things the uh, amount of armor piercing increases dramatic tremendous so we have then an amount of armor piercing damage of 345 and a bonus versus infantry so if you want to save money this is quite decent 
The next slot on the roster is the High Queen Kalida. And the High Queen Kalida is a quite good duelist. She's causing poison attacks, has very good melee stats, melee attack, melee defense. The weapon strength is okay. But she is also on foot, not the highest amount of AP damage. Also, the armor is on foot, not the best. So we have just 50. So if you sit her on a Necro Serpent, the stats uh, increases tremendous also here we have then a much higher amount of armor piercing damage of 315 and also the amount of armor increases a lot we have 90 over here so it's uh, the most competitive way to pick here is on a necro serpent and also skeletal chair skeleton skeleton chariot is available but i i, I would always recommend to bring her on a necro serpent you can just deploy this combination for about 2000 credits and there are also some really useful abilities available for example the curse or my will be done so um it's high queen kalida is in my opinion a little bit underrated she's quite a good duelist on the necro serpent So let's come to the Grand Hero Pad Katab, and he's a pure spellcaster and not designed to fight in melee combat against other units. He's not a hybrid unit, as I said, just a pure spellcaster. He is very low on armor, has really bad melee stats, and the weapon strength is also really low. He's using the Nehekarin magical lore and is able to sit on a skeletal steed, a skeleton chariot, and as the only lord on the list on a casket of souls and on a casket of souls he works as a artillery unit but overall he's too high priced for that performance and you can leave him out he's not a competitive pick so let's come to the most competitive lord on the list the ark of the black and Ark of the Black is a spellcaster, but for a spellcaster he has quite good melee stats also. So we have a melee attack of 40, melee defense of 50, weapon strength of 450, and the amount of armor is 90. And this is for a spellcaster quite good, even if he is not designed to fight in melee combat. Um, the, the reason why he is the most competitive lord is because he using the law of death with Fate of Buna and Spirit Leech. And you can set him on a skeleton steed or a skeleton chariot. He has also abilities available. So overall, um, as I said, he's the most competitive lord and quite cost efficient. Romantic. So let's come to Setra the Imperishable. And Setra is a hybrid unit. He's a spellcaster and a melee expert and he's declared as a Harvard infantry unit and that tells you he is anti-large and Setra has really supreme melee combat stats not only for a spellcaster but of all so we have a weapon strength of 470 and this is quite a lot of stuff the amount of armor piercing damage is 330 also very huge and in addition to that a bonus versus large of 20 55 melee defense, 60 melee attack, and the amount of armor is 80. So as I said, really supreme melee combat stats. He is using the Nehekarian magical, uh, magical lore and is able to sit on a skeletal steed, a Camrian war sphinx, and a chariot of the gods. And the chariot of the gods and the Camrian war sphinx are really mighty mounts, but also very expensive. And here's the point, Setra is the best lord on the list but also by far the most expensive so no matter which setup you take you are probably going to spend over 3000 credits to deploy Setra. but even though in my opinion the performance of Setra is so efficient that in some cases he's really worth the price because he's really a monster So let's start or let's continue with the heroes and start with the Necrotech. And the Necrotech is an anti infantry hero. We have a weapon strength of 360, that is, a, that is good. The ammo piercing damage is 120, what is okay. But therefore, we have a bonus versus infantry of 20. The other stats are quite ordinary, I would say. For a hero, is the melee defense of 30 quite low? But therefore, we have a quite good melee attack of 45. But the amount of armor and leadership is not the highest. 
Therefore, the Necrotech has different abilities to support uh, the constructs to heal them up, for example. What is quite or what is a, a good ability or good feature. And you can sit him on a skeleton chariot also. So in a blob of infantry units, the performance of the Necrotech can be quite okay, can be quite good. But the most important thing is the ability or the abilities to support the constructs over here. So this combination works fine just for a fight against infantry. I wouldn't pick him. But if you bring uh, constructs to the battlefield, in some cases, the Necrotech can pay off. So let's come to the Tomb Prince and the Tomb Prince is in my opinion more relevant because he is anti-large and also his other stats are quite good. We have weapon strength overall of 370, the amount of armor piercing damage is 260, what is quite a lot for a hero. This is very good. And in addition to that we have a bonus versus large of 25. The melee defense with nearly 50 is very good, a melee attack of 36 is okay, uh, he has a silver shield, the amount of armor is okay, so overall very good combat stats, especially of course against fight fights against um, large entities, single large entities, the performance is here really superior. Unfortunately he has not really good abilities, so you can leave all the abilities in the most cases, but you can sit him on a skeletal steed and a skeleton chariot. And of course you will always sit him on a skeletal steed, because he's more uh, tanky on a skeletal steed, he's not so squishy in fights against large entities, and he is has, he has, he's really dangerous for large entities and really pay off. So he's more expensive than a Necrotect of course, but always worth the price if you are facing up against large entities. So let's come to the spellcasters and we have three different types available. The Lich Priest with Law of Death, with Law of Light and with the Nehikaran Magical Law. And the, mo the biggest problem over here is probably that um, Arkham the Black already has the Law of uh, the Death and etc. and the Imperishable and the Grand Hero Part Katep also using the Nehikaran Magical Law. So the most uh, lords you can choose from already uh, are spellcasters so in the most cases another spellcaster is not necessary but anyway the law of death of course the most competitive law actually is available with the lich priest the lich priest the law of light is not so competitive but also in some cases quite good and the neocarian magical law is also available so overall nothing more to say about that you can sit all spellcasters on a skeletal steed and as i said if you are choose or if you're taking a, a melee combat law to the battlefield, you can bring, of course, a Lich Priest in addition. So let's continue with the infantry and let's start with the Skeleton Warriors. And the Skeleton Warriors are by far the worst unit on the Tomb King army roster. So these guys are relatively pricey, so we have a price of 325 credits. So, uh, so you are in the most cases not able to mass them. So overall they are not cost efficient. We have very horrific stats over here. I mean, give me a break. We have a melee attack of 18 and um, armor of 10. <laughs> It's completely useless over here. They have a silver shield, quite interesting. But overall, you can leave these guys out. I would always prefer to bring skeleton spearmen because these guys are by far not cost efficient. So then let's continue with the skeleton spearmen. These guys are also, in my opinion, quite pricey for the performance. So also not really the most cost efficient unit, you can say. But at least they are anti-large, they are shielded. And they have a quite okay melee defense. We have 30 over here. The amount of armor is also very low. But overall they have a anti-large bonus of 13. So they are able to hold the line for some time. Also against low tier infantry. So I would, as I said, always prefer to bring skeleton spearmen. Even if these guys are also not really cost efficient. So let's continue with the Neokaran warriors. These guys are damage dealers, anti-infantry. Um, the weapon, they have a weapon strength of 33, um, what is okay. Um, the melee attack is 32, also not the best, but okay. Typically, of course, the melee defense is very low. The amount of armor is also not really high. So overall, also not the best stats, also not for a damage dealer unit. 
um, but the price is 575 so in, so in, in cases of if you are facing up against a lot of low tier units like from escape and stuff like that these guys can pay off but also here not the most cost efficient unit so let's come to the king neckish scorpion legion and these are the regiments of renown of the skeleton spearmen and we have um, yeah a much higher amount of armor over here plus 35 they have also a silver shield, the melee attack is higher, melee defense is higher, and they're causing poison attacks. But overall, the price is nearly the double, and this is a lot of stuff uh, regarding the price of the skeleton spearmen. So they are never worth the price. I would leave them out completely, because the performance boost is not so much, and you pay nearly, as I said, the double of a normal group of skeleton spearmen. So they are not worth the price. So just negative statements till now, <laughs> but so let's talk about something positive over here with the Tomb Guards. These guys are, in my opinion, yeah, the most cost-efficient unit on the infantry roster. These guys are arm uh, armored and shielded. We have a silver shield over here. They have a the amount of armor is 50, okay, but we have a quite also the melee attack with 32 is okay, but we have a quite good melee defense of 41, what is quite good. The weapon strength is 42, also very good. And uh, but of course the these guys also causing nearly no armor piercing damage. But overall for 750 credits the performance is quite decent. I wouldn't say it's perfectly cost efficient, but they are more cost efficient than all other units on the infantry roster, and I can re really recommend to bring them against inf other infantry units, of course. So let's come to the halberd version, and these guys causing armor piercing damage. We have an amount of armor piercing damage of 20, and in addition to that, these guys are anti-large, they have a bonus versus large of 90. The melee defense is also very good over here, nearly superior, we have 47, therefore the melee t attack with 25 is very low. They have also a silver shield, the amount of armor is not the highest, but the performance is, in my opinion, quite good, especially of course against large entities and we don't have to forget this is the only armor piercing unit on the roster. So for 850 credits I would really say these guys are cost efficient. So in my opinion the halberd version or the sword and shield version are the most cost efficient units over here and um, if you need AP damage the two cards with halberds are really, really good for that. So last but not least, let's talk about the Capra Guard. And it is a little bit confusing over here because they are declared as a regiment of renown of the Tomb Guards. And in my opinion, this is false. They are regiment of renown of the Neokar and Warriors because these guys are damage dealers. But I could be wrong. Please let me know in the comments if I'm wrong. But I will now compare the stats of the Capra Guards with the stats of the Neokar and Warriors. In my opinion, this is the right way. The Capra Guard has much higher stats nearly on every point. Regarding the stats of the Neokar and Warriors, much more hit points, melee defense and weapon strength, a little bit more armor and a little bit more melee attack. But overall, the price is also much higher. So we have a price over 1000 credits, nearly the double. So it's, in my opinion, not worth the price even if these guys have regeneration and causing magical attacks and also the amount of armor piercing damage is not so low so we have 15 what is okay for a unit that is not declared as an ap unit um but overall as i said the price is really really high and um, against low tier factions to slice and dice all these low tier units it's it's a little bit too high priced and i wouldn't recommend to bring them so overall i would say in summary is the Tomb King Infantry the worst infantry roster in this complete game? In my opinion, you have a very small selection of different units and also they work at best, work as a meat shield. Uh, so sort of, they're not really cost efficient. They are quite high priced for the performance. So as I said, at best as a meat shield. So they need support from other arms of service like the monsters, just the infantry. Um, is not performing very well and you are not going to win games with just infantry.
So let's continue with the missile infantry and let's start with the skeleton archers. And not much to say about them. These guys are so low tier. So if I compare the stats of the skeleton archers, for example, to the stats of the Ungar Raiders or Peasant Bowmen, other low tier missile infantry units of the game, we can see that the skeleton archers, the stats are much worse. So one of the worst missile infantry units of the complete game maybe the the worst missile infantry unit of the complete game so i mean they have very low range the missile damage is very low the armor piercing amount is nearly zero of the missiles and um, therefore they have a relatively high price with nearly 500 so they're really not cost efficient and just in some matchups worth to bring for example if you're facing up a lot of low tier units but they are really not cost efficient at all So let's continue with the Blessed Legion of Pack, the Regiment of Renown of the Skeleton Archers. And quite an interesting fact over here is that these guys have armor sundering and they will reduce the armor of your opponent by 30. What is a lot of stuff over here and this is a quite interesting fact. They have overall a much higher range so we have 160, the amount of armor is higher, the melee stats are a little bit higher but this, this information is quite useless. Um, so armor sundering is a quite interesting fact and you can deploy the group for 725 credits in my opinion also a lot of stuff but in some cases it can be really an advantage if you are reducing the armor of your opponent by 30 so in some cases these guys are worth to bring and of much the cost efficiency is higher than the normal skeleton archers for sure. So let's continue with the cavalry and chariots and let's start with the skeleton horsemen and I'm a big fan of the skeleton horsemen. I personally really like to play with them. I'm overall a big fan of low tier cavalry, very cheap cavalry and these guys are very cheap. Um, for the, uh, uh, They are really cost efficient in my opinion. You, you can deploy one group for 400 credits. Of course the stats overall are really low. I mean we have a melee attack of 22, a melee defense of 26, a really low charge bonus of 26. But at least they are shielded and are really able to take out a, a group of low tier missile infantry or chase, uh, chase out um, routing units for this purposes these guys are really good and as I said you can deploy one group for 400 credits so if also if you lose the group against um, mid-range or high tier cavalry you do nothing wrong uh, you, lo you lost 400 credits in this case so it's uh, in my opinion worth to bring in some matchups and uh, I really love to play with them then we have also a sword and shield version called the Nehe Carrion Horseman as I said, they are shielded, they are anti-infantry, they have much more armor, so we have an armor of 50 over here, um, a higher weapon strength, 38, what is quite decent, um, um, quite okay or quite good, melee defense is 35 and the melee attack 28, so the stats overall are not bad, they're quite good or quite okay, also a little amount of armor piercing damage of 10. And you can deploy these guys for 650 credits. So also here, in my opinion, a quite cost efficient unit. It's not so expensive. Of course, you don't have to expect any wonders. Don't mess up against uh, high tier cavalry or mid range cavalry. But overall, they can they can uh, fight in melee combat for some time against mid range infantry or low tier infantry or take out enemy archers and stuff like that. For this purposes, these guys are really good, and I can recommend to bring them in some matchups. So you can just say that the Nair Khan horsemen are the better version of the skeleton horsemen. I know some player may think that the skeleton horsemen with their spear are a anti-large version or something like that, but it isn't it isn't like this. The skeleton horsemen are also just a melee combat unit, nothing special over here, and the Nehe Karen horsemen are the better version so they are nearly better on each point so if you need a, a better cavalry unit that is able to stay in melee combat for some time against mid-range and low tier units you need the Nehe Karen horsemen you spend 250 credits extra charge and in some cases it's worth the price yeah so yeah you have to decide so overall there is no high tier cavalry uh, available on the Tomb King army roster but these two units are really cost efficient in my opinion and really worth to bring in some matchups 
So let's come to the skeleton chariots and the skeleton chariots have really bad melee stats but therefore they have a bonus versus infantry of 12 what is quite good the charge bonus of 52 is also good but the most interesting fact these guys you get nine models with just one unit and this is quite unique but therefore they have a very uh, just a they are very low on mass so they are not really overrun all infantry units and the other problem is a little bit with the micromanagement because all the time one or two chariots get stuck in a group of infantry units so it's very difficult to control them so i wouldn't recommend to bring them they are not the best unit even if the price is not really high we have a price of 900 but overall as i said they are really difficult to control and um, they, are, they are not good at all, I would say, or not worth to bring. So let's talk about the missile cavalry and missile chariots and let's start with the skeleton horsemen, archers and these guys. Um, nothing much to say about them. Also here very low missile damage of 18, what is very low. The amount of armor piercing is free. They have a very low range of 140, so you have to be really close to the target you would like to shoot on. Therefore, they, they are quite fast. We have 76 speed. You can deploy them in a vanguard position. So if you like to play with missile cavalry, can bring these guys. Yeah, the price is 500 credits, so it's okay. Um, there's nothing more to say about that, but also here quite low tier overall. So let's talk about the skeleton archer chariot. And if we take a look on the missile damage over here, we can see there's nearly 50 and the amount of armor piercing missile damage is 10. So these stats over here are quite superior, you can say. But all, overall, we don't have to forget we have just one a single one unit in each chariot shooting on enemy targets and that is not really much so we have nine different uh, uh, units shooting on enemy targets so it won't add up even if this if the damage output for a single entity is quite high but of course you can also use the chariot to overrun enemy infantry groups to use the charge bonus over here but overall i wouldn't say it's worth to bring them so the extra charge to the normal chariots is just 100 but in my opinion if you want to play with chariots or if you need chariots take the normal chariots and if you want to do some harass damage take the skeleton horsemen archers i wouldn't recommend to bring them um, it's not worth it even if the damage output is uh, the missile damage is quite good So let's talk about the monsters and constructs and let's start with the carrions and I am a big fan of the carrions because these guys are really cost efficient. You can deploy a group for 350 credits, um, you can deploy them in a vanguard position, they have a speed of 100 but the most important fact is over here that they have really good melee stats. We have a melee defense of nearly 50, in fact 46, what is really superior. The melee attack therefore is not the highest so we have just 26 but we have a weapon strength of 40 very good and the amount of armor piercing damage is also not really bad so we have 10 so these guys would really benefit from a spell that increases the melee attack overall you can these guys are not only a harass unit to kill enemy missile infantry or artillery units these guys are also able to stay in melee combat against mid-range or low tier infantry units for some time the only disadvantage is over here that the model count is only 18 and we don't have to forget this is not not really high so we have just a few models but overall they're really cost efficient and i can really recommend to play with them so let's come to the Ushapti and the Ushapti are one of the most important units on the complete roster. The Ushapti are very heavily armored with an amount of armor of 100 and uh, you know, maybe notice that the other units of the, of the Tomb Kings are very low on armor. This is for example one reason why the infantry is so weak, they are very low on armor. But these Ushapti are very high on armor, we have an amount of armor of 100 but the most important fact over here is of course the armor piercing damage so we have amount of armor piercing damage of 52 and these guys are for that purpose uh, uh, very very important to support the infantry which is very low on AP value and these guys have a very good very good support 
superior amount of armor piercing damage of 52 and also they have a bonus versus infantry a very small one of five but anyway this is very good the melee defense is 35 the melee attack 23 so the melee attack overall is very low also these guys would really benefit from spells that increases their melee attack for example byrona's time warp from the law of light would really uh, the, these guys would really get a huge boost uh, performance boost and yeah nothing more to say about them they are armor piercing they have a little bonus versus infantry the only disadvantage over here that these guys have just 12 models only it's not so much but they are really important if you need a lot of ap damage and uh, these guys are really a very fantastic unit because these guys have as i said really superior stats overall a weapon strength of 72 what is very high and uh, the best use is to bring them in your own infantry ranks that they are not isolated and that you are let them fight against other infantry armored infantry units that is the best use for them and then you will get the highest performance output so let's talk about the ushapti with great bow these guys causing armor piercing missile damage and a tremendous amount of that so we have 104 the amount of missile damage is 124 overall what is quite incredible very very huge the missile range is 255 uh, the highest missile range of all missile infantry units in my opinion this range is incredible high so these guys nearly shoot from the start on uh, over the complete battlefield nearly this is quite incredible they have also a very high weapon strength of 65 the amount of armor piercing damage of the melee combat weapon strength is 47 um, the melee defense is 35 and the melee attack 23 so overall these guys also work as a melee combat unit if it is necessary they have a very high, high amount of lead, uh, armor so 100 so overall a uh, very good unit unfortunately um, on this Oshapti with great bow the arm the arm uh, arrows don't spread so it's just one arrow that hit one target this is uh, the splash damage there is not really a splash damage this is the only disadvantage so it's more um useful to uh, to 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 shoot on large entities or single entities in my opinion but overall this is a very good unit uh, only disadvantage here just nine models so let's directly continue with the Chosen of the Gods, the Regiment of Renown. And uh, they have better melee attack, melee defense. And a uh, quite interesting fact is that these guys have an ability called Shield Breaker, what reduces the missile parry by 25, uh, 20 by 24 and this is quite a lot of stuff therefore they have a little bit lower amount of missile damage overall so minus 24 regarding the normal ushapti but their missiles spread so um, if you shoot on enemy infantry their missiles spread close before the target so that means these guys causing splash damage and we have a splash damage amount called explosive armor piercing damage of 26 and this is the highest advantage in my opinion so these guys are really able to do a horrific amount of damage to infantry units also because they can hit several models with just one arrow and this is in my opinion the biggest advantage and also over here the extra charge is not really much so we have just 150 extra charge the price is over all 1250 credits it's it is not cheap but it is really cost efficient to these guys causing a tremendous amount of damage and i can recommend to bring the chosen of the gods because as i said the extra charge is not really much you can also bring a chosen one group of chosen of the gods and one group of normal normal ushapti with great bow these guys are really the performance is really really good so let's talk about the sepulchral stalkers these guys are anti-large and causing armor piercing damage they have a weapon strength of 78 and the amount of armor piercing damage is 57 but it's very huge the amount they have a bonus versus large of 21 as i said they are anti-large they are quite heavily armored or the amount of armor is quite good we have 80 over here but also quite interesting is that they have ammunition so they have a missile attack and the ammon they're causing poison attacks with the uh, uh, magical attacks with that and poison attacks and 
the amount of missile damage is also very good we have 107 and the amount of armor piercing over here is 12 so very good stats overall um nothing more to say about that these guys are for a um anti-large unit quite uh, quite cost efficient i would say 1200 credits is a quite decent price but also to get a lot of performance so i would say the uh, these guys are cost efficient for especially designed in my opinion to fight enemy cavalry of course also the only problem you have just the model count of 12 models and this is the only disadvantage i would say but you can also as i, for, uh, I forgot to say these guys you can deploy them in the vanguard position so there's also a regiment of renown available the eyes of the desert from the sepulchral stalkers these guys uh, the most significant point over here is that these guys have much more missile damage and also they have us uh, have this stalk ability also quite interesting fact but i wouldn't say it's okay the extra charge is just 150 but as i said the sepulchral stalkers are for itself quite strong so there is not really a need for a higher missile damage and the stalk ability as i said the sepulchral stalkers are also available to deploy them in a vanguard position so even if the extra charge is here not really much i wouldn't say it's worth to bring the eyes of the desert so let's talk about the necropolis knights these guys are not anti-large they're causing poison attacks I have a melee attack of 40 melee defense of 36 the weapon strength with 55 they're causing a lot of armor piercing damage the amount is 36 they're quite heavily armored with the amount of 90 they have a silver shield so they are designed to fight wouldn't say armored infantry in my opinion um, the price is we are quite high we have a price of 1300 credits so maybe in some cases worth the price but the tomb kings have other tools so there's not really a task for these guys and i would leave them out even if they are not bad so there's also a halberd version of the necropolis knights available these guys are lower on melee attack melee defense weapon strength overall also the amount of armor piercing damage is a little bit lower um this the rest is quite the same except for the anti-large bonus so these guys are anti-large and they have a bonus versus large of 28 what is quite a lot of stuff and this is the only difference over here or the only advantage that these guys are anti-large they're also not shielded so if you need an anti-large unit you can pay these 100 extra charge but as i said these guys are now quite expensive for 1400 credits and it uh, it's preferable to take something else to um to compete against large entities their purpose would be to fight other large entities with several models like trolls or demigriff knights but their model count is also not the highest so in my opinion i wouldn't recommend to bring them so let's talk about the tomb scorpion and the tomb scorpion is another tool to fight against uh, armored infantry so the tomb kings as already mentioned have not so much tools in the infantry to, with armor piercing damage or to compete against armored units armored infantry units so you need other stuff like ushapti and tomb scorpions the tomb scorpion is very heavily armored itself with one one amount of 100 the melee attack is 40 melee defense is 35 and the weapon strength is 380 very high the amount of armor piercing damage is 270 so a lot of stuff and the tomb scorpion has a bonus versus infantry it's not mentioned in the tooltips but we have a bonus over here of 10. another interesting fact is that you are able to deploy the tomb scorpion in a vanguard position it's not really um, a big thing but also worth to be mentioned and also quite interesting is it's not shown everywhere but the tomb scorpion has quite unique fighting animations so it's very difficult to catch him yeah he's bur he burrows himself in the ground and jumps up and all that stuff so it's in a fight uh, within a huge group of infantry units very difficult for your opponent to kill the tomb scorpion or to damage him so this is a quite mighty foe when it comes in a, in a fight against armored infantry and um, is a quite good tool the price is 1000 credits so it's very cost efficient and really worth to bring as as i said especially against if you expect a lot of armored infantry 
the next big monster is the, is the Camrian War Sphinx. It's also possible to sit uh, different lords, um, etc., the Imperishable and the Tomb King on a, a Camrian War Sphinx. So it's in the most cases not necessary to bring an additional one. But a Cameron Wall Sphinx is really good or really um, designed for fighting enemy infantry, especially, of course, also here armored infantry. And the Cameron Wall Sphinx itself is very heavily armored, so we have an amount of armor of 110, a weapon strength of 480, what is quite a lot of stuff. The amount of armor piercing is 340, incredible high, and then we have a small um, bonus versus infantry of 15. 34, melee attack. 42 melee defense so superior stats all over then we have a little bit missile damage so on the top of the cameron wolf things are a few um, skeleton archers but nothing special over here overall the cameron wolf things is a huge and mighty monster also very difficult for inf especially for infantry to snipe out because the camion war sphinx dancing all over infantry units and jump all over so it's not so easy to kill her but as I said, in the most cases, it's preferable to take the Cameron Wall Sphinx with a Lord that you are not um, have to pay the additional 1,800 credits. But as I said, mighty monster, nothing more to say about that. So let's come to the Hyro Titan. And the Hyro Titan is a better giant, you can say. A much better giant overall. So he's also designed to fight armored infantry. But very special over here, we have magical attacks and flaming attacks. The weapon strength is 550. This is a lot of stuff over here. And the amount of armor piercing damage is 413. So this is huge. The amount of armor itself is 110. The problem is he's quite vulnerable because he's very slow. We have a speed of 32 and this is very, very slow and he's the first target for enemy artillery and stuff like that. So it's not so easy to protect him. But overall, as I said, very superior stats. Nothing more to say about that. We have um, a melee attack of 52 and a melee defense of 52. This is, this is very good. In addition to that, we have two activated abilities. One is Spirit Leech. One of the strongest, uh, one of the strongest spells in the game, and the other one is Sham Burning Gaze, Sham's Burning Gaze. So quite very good over here. Uh, that uh, the here Hyro Titan has additional spells, uh, activated abilities in this case, so he don't use the uh, Winds of Magic. It's just the activated ability. You can use Spirit Leech one time, and Sham's Burning Gaze. I think two times. Yeah, two times. He's, he's a better giant and uh, the biggest difference over here is that he's much more armored as a giant. We have an amount of armor of 110. For example, a giant has just uh, 30 and this is one of the biggest differences over here. He's a horror for all infantry units, but overall the price is of course also quite decent over here. We have um, a price of 2000 credits. So it's in the most matchups quite dangerous to bring him to the battlefield because you spend 2000 credits for one big single target. So let's talk about the Necro Sphinx and the Necro Sphinx is also an incredible strong monster. We have the same amount of armor over here, 110, uh, 42 uh, melee attack, 50 melee defense, 550 a weapon strength incredibly high the amount of armor piercing damage is 400 and we have a bonus versus large of 35 so the necro sphinx is designed to fight large entities large uh, large single entities for example to fight against the dragon or a shagget or a colic and stuff like that and for this purposes the necro sphinx is really strong i think one of the strongest monsters till now and in my opinion, if you are probably facing up against a lot of giants, shaggots and all that stuff, a necro sphinx is really necessary. You have to bring her and um, yeah, nothing more to say about that incredible strong monster and uh, can really recommend to bring if you are facing up against single large entities. Interesting fact is that the necro sphinx um, should be able to take out or to kill a dragon or a shaggot. The price is the same, but we have um, much more armor on the side of the Necro Sphinx plus 40 and the weapon strength of plus 90. Um, the Shagget has more melee attack, but overall the Necro Sphinx should be able to kill a Shagget and this is quite incredible. Much more incredible is the fact that we have also Regiment of Renown here, the Sphinx of Usak. These, um, these Necro Sphinx has plus 10 melee attack, plus 10 
melee defense causing magical and flaming attacks and a little bit more melee attack and a lot of more hit points so we have plus 1000 quite incredible fact over here um so simply much simply stronger and also uh, the fact that she causing um flaming attacks and magical attacks is also in some cases advantage so if you are facing up against uh, war the warriors of chaos for example it's preferable also to spend the 350 credits extra charge for the sphinx of usek you will be happy about this decision if you're facing up against the jagged and a colec so in my opinion the 350 credits extra charge is worth the price if you are facing up, for example, against the Warriors of Chaos. So let's talk about artillery and war machines. And we have here, or we let's start with the Screaming Skull Catapult. And the Screaming Skull Catapult is a quite good artillery machine. It's for uh, yeah, to for anti-infantry to kill infantry units. We have a range of 380, what is quite okay, quite good. Um, the amount of uh, damage is 171. We have a huge amount of splash damage of 65, and the amount of armor piercing damage is 120. What is quite good, everything good stats. Um, uh, the Screaming Skull Catapult has an ability called Take Over, reduces the, me the leadership by minus eight. Also, very quite good, quite good fact. And as I said, she causing uh, the Screaming Skull Catapult causing uh, poison attacks. So in some cases, against infantry, a low tier infantry, but also armored infantry, the Screaming Skull Catapult is a quite good artillery unit because especially it's not very really pricey. So we have a price of seven hundred fifty, and in my opinion, this is quite cost efficient. For, for that performance and as I said in some cases really worth to bring. So let's talk about the Casket of Soul and the Casket of Soul is also anti-infantry um, uh, artillery so there is no anti-large artillery available no cannons and stuff like that on a Toon King roster so we have also here anti-infantry artillery we have a tremendous amount of damage 860 what is quite incredible therefore the armor piercing missile damage is 90 so a little bit lower than the armor piercing missile damage of the screaming skull catapult and also the ex uh, the splash damage of 50 56 is also not so high like on the screaming skull catapult therefore we have a range of 440 what is quite high very high so you can shoot from the first second on in the most cases all over the field but we have a huge problem over here the casket of soul has a horrific accuracy um it's similar to the accuracy of the hellstorm um Hellstorm rocket battery from the from the Empire. So in the most cases, it's not worth to bring uh, because we have a price of 1,300 credits over here, and this is a lot of stuff. So it's not cost efficient, n not uh, never cost efficient in nev no no way. So I would leave out the casket of soul completely. As I said, the ac accuracy is horrific. Uh, we have a much better accuracy on a screaming skull catapult and. A much better price on the screaming skull catapult 1300 credits for the casket of soul is not worth it you can leave this out completely Yo guys, as promised, here the tactical part. I'm going to show you two or three different builds you can use, competitive builds you can use against your enemies. But all of you know, um, the build you are creating depends on which faction you are going to face up. So uh, it's not easy to uh, say this is a general build or a round build, but I think I have two or three different builds for you that's working well in two or three different situations. And this build over here, I created for a fight against, for example, against Chaos, against heavily armored units, and um, also with monsters. And I have a front line over here, you can see I have five different skeleton spearmen in my front line. Directly behind that, I have three groups of Ushapti, and you need these Ushapti against, uh, uh, especially against the Chaos Warriors of Chaos, because these guys causing armor piercing damage. So you have a very weak front line over here. These guys are a meat shield, you can say. At least they are able to hold the line for a, for some time, for maybe a short period of time. But as I said, you have your Ushapti in support, and this mix over here works quite well. 
On each side we have an AP unit, the two guard with halberge on the right and on the left flank. These guys causing armor piercing damage and uh, at this point they're protecting your sides over here but you can also put them in the front line or behind the front line to yeah to engage in a fight in front line fight over here then we have a uh, necro sphinx and this is the normal necro sphinx as i said in this in this faction guide you can also take the regiment of renown it's worth the price especially against the shaggits against Kolek. but in this case i am um, yeah for um, I saved the money and took the normal Necro Sphinx because I have in addition two additional anti-large units the Tomb Prince over here two Tomb Princes on a scattered skid these guys are anti-large so the mix of two, two Tomb Princes with one Necro Sphinx is really good so they are really able to take out a Kolik, a Shagin and or both then we have Ark in the Black and as I said I stretched everything very wide so I used every cent to um, to get a unit and therefore I have I took a arc and the black on a skeletal steed but just with fate of Buna. Fate of Buna is in my opinion one of the most important spells actually and it's it's very important to melt away chaos warriors with red buttons and stuff like that. So I trust um, fate of Buna over here. And last but not least uh a uh, tomb scorpion over here this tomb scorpion is very important also for um, causing trouble in enemy front lines uh, chaos warriors with great weapons are really vulnerable to this guy and also as i said additionally against the very heavily armored infantry so this is a very good build in my opinion i think if you are facing up against chaos for example and uh, if you're facing up against very armored infantry and also monsters for example So guys, the next build I'm going to show you is uh, is optimated for a fight against um, factions that are able to bring a lot of units to the battlefield, a lot of low tier units like the green skin or the Skaven. And as you can see over here, I brought also a lot of units in this build over here. Every slot is used. So let's take a short look on my front line. And as you can see, I have a very wide front line over here and the front line is in a mix with um, Nehekarn warriors and skeleton spearmen so that ensures that I'm not getting um, uh, getting flanked really hard from the Skaven or from the green skin so I have a very wide front line also. Ne Nehekarn warriors are good for slice and dice um, small uh, <laughs> low tier units I mean and the skeleton spearmen are able to hold the line for a good time against mid range or low tier units directly behind my front line i have two groups of tomb guards these guys are just for the support performing good against non-armored or low armored infantry units then we have a tomb scorpion over here because all infantry units in the complete game struggle or have problems with the tomb scorpion except maybe for the phoenix guard or the black guard of nagaron and then i brought a setra the imperishable with different abilities on spells on the chariot of the gods for example rough of petra um causing explosive exploding damage around himself is if he gets surrounded from a lot of skaven for example then sakmet's incantation of the skull storm and usirian's incantation of the Ven of vengeance so different spells and abilities over here quite expensive by my opinion in this matchup worth the price but of course you have to be careful if you're facing up against skaven for example the warp lightning cannon is a very dangerous foe against your uh, against your large entity so also never bring a hyro titan for example against the skaven against the green skin i would probably bring one but against this game never because a hyro titan gets down very fast from the wild lightning cannon also here um it, the tomb scorpion is not so a easy target he's very it's very flat on the ground so it's in, in the most cases he, he gets not hit with every shot so it's a little bit has a little natural protection over here but you of course also said really have to be really careful then i brought two groups of carrions and these guys of course also good for fighting low tier infantry and for sniping out if the enemy brings a warp lightning cannon or uh, or a missile infantry and stuff like that these guys are designed for something like that and 
on the left flank over here also in a vanguard position free skeleton horsemen these guys really pay off if you're facing up against a fa low a factions with low, a lot of low tier units because they are really able to snap out any missile infantry artillery and as i said against low tier faction with low tier units also maybe against some low tier infantry units these guys are really good as i said 400 credits for each unit you do nothing wrong in this matchup i would say so this was their build this build over here and yeah let's come to the next build So let's come to the last build I'm going to show you and I already showed you one build against heavily armored factions, high tier factions with a lot of high tier units and one against a low tier faction or factions with a lot of low tier units and this is a little bit a mid range build I, I would say. So let's take a look on that. So also here I have a front line of skeleton spearmen, four groups directly behind that I brought Neakar and warriors in the middle two groups over here and on each side a group of two guards in the middle i have in addition the necrotect i have a lot of constructs in this build and this guy over here is able to fight in the front line against infantry units um, because he has very superior stats for doing that also bonus his infantry and is able to heal the constructs and to support the constructs with his our with his auras over here with this stone shaper wrath of the creator or uh, regenerate them with restore so i brought this necrotect and on each side in my third line i brought a tomb scorpion against inf all infantry as i said superior against infantry all infantry struggle against the tomb scorpion as i said except for phoenix guard or black guard of nagron then also here Ark and the Black with Spirit Leech and Fate of Buna this time and the Curse over here this ability. And then in the middle to the Chosen of the Gods to Shapti with Great Bow. And as I said these guys are especially very very good because their uh, arrows spread and they're causing splash damage. And last but not least they brought a Hyrule Titan but of course you can also bring a Necro Sphinx depends on the matchup as i said so a lot of constructs over here very massive heavy construct build to two tomb scorpions a hero titan chosen of the gods and yeah and yeah also here i brought for harass um, enemy artillery or missile infantry units two groups of carriers so i think these guys are quite decent it depends uh, if you're going to bring carriers or skeleton horsemen against which faction you're going to face up against the empire i would probably bring carrions not skeleton horsemen so against factions with a very good cavalry i would bring carrions because um, your opponent are going to, is going to bring a lot of cavalry probably so carrions are the better pick then but anyway uh, i hope you like my build if you have any questions as i said this is just um it depends always against which player you are going to face up or against this, which faction so it's not so easy to create builds just in general but i think these three builds are quite decent but anyway so let's come to the summary over here So let's come to the summary. I would say the Toon Kings are a high tier or at least mid range faction cause they should have a lot of good matchups even if they have a lot of disadvantages also. As already mentioned they have a really weak infantry in my opinion the weakest infantry in a complete game and also everything what isn't a monster is very low on armor and so on and so on. But even though the performance, if you are able to protect your monsters and if you are fighting against your enemy with the right build, you're probably going to succeed because the Tomb Kings have a lot of power in their builds with the constructs, a lot of crushing powers to crush the enemy frontline, to overwhelm the enemy frontline. That is the advantage of the Tomb Kings because your opponent has to deal with these constructs, with these massive monsters and this is not so easy. So this is the end, uh, also over here a lot of stuff I know, 
But thank you for tuning in as always. Please let me know what you think about this faction guide over here. We are probably going to receive the Norske DLC in a couple of days. So I'm also very excited. And of course I will do a uh, Norske faction guide in the future. But let me know what you would like to see. Let me know what you think. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you.